Starting with Dr. Bennis, if you go online and read one of his many bios, you'll hear things like the fact that he uh, was named by Forbes magazine as Dean of the Leadership Gurus and that his books have been nominated for various prizes and have done all sorts of good things. And that's all true. And it's about like saying Abraham Lincoln was tall and had a beard. Okay. <laughs> so here's the truth about Dr. Bennis. It's been said that you can tell the difference between an expert and a master if you ask them a question. And the expert will tell you the answer. And then you go away and you feel smarter because you know the answer. And the master will say, that's a really interesting question. Why don't you sit down and we'll talk about it? Which is why you often see uh, Dr. Bennis sitting down with various people talking about some interesting things. And typical of how masters like to conduct sessions, you'll notice that we have a couple of chairs here so that we get to sit down and learn together. I would say that if you can get inside the way that Dr. Bennis sees the world even a little bit, then the session will pay dividends that will go on for many, many years. Uh, I've had the opportunity to write books that have been on bestseller lists and th things of that nature, and I will tell you that 100% of the inspiration uh, has come from Dr. Bennis, and uh, he probably doesn't know that, but it's true. I'm here because he's at USC, and I have written the books because he's inspired them. And I say that not, again, to in any way highlight myself, but there are thousands of people around the world that would say exactly the same thing, people far more influential or successful than I will ever be. It's said of leaders that leaders promote and support other leaders, who in turn support and promote other leaders. And by that definition, you won't find a greater leader in the world than Warren, because he promotes the people and supports the people who support the people who support the people who support the people who, the people who actually do leadership. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet uh, our second guest, Tony Shea, a couple of years ago. I got an email from him in his characteristic lowercase style that he's famous for on email, saying, hi, Dave, you don't know me. My name is Tony Shea. I run a company called Zappos. I had heard of neither Tony Shea nor Zappos, which I'm embarrassed to say. And I was talking to my wife about the fact that I get emails from time to time. And she said, well, like who? And I mentioned those two names. And, and after she called me an idiot for a couple of minutes, she said, you have no idea how special that company was. And so I got to know Tony, went out to Las Vegas. If you ever have the opportunity to go see Zappos, it is like going to the mecca of organizational culture. In other words, we can have intellectual discussions about it, but until you see it, until you experience it, then you don't really understand what, or, what organizational culture uh, can be. The thing about Tony is he exemplifies, he is the walking embodiment of the values of Zappos. So in a sense, you don't need to go to Zappos, although very much hope you all do. It will blow your minds in a very good way. But Tony is the walking embodiment of the values of his company, things like humility. Uh, he's been called quirky. Uh, one, of the va one of the values of Zappos is be a little bit weird, okay? And Tony exemplifies that with pride. Most of all, service. I was in a meeting with Tony not too long ago, and I looked to where he had been sitting and realized he was, wasn't sitting there anymore because he was refilling someone's water glass. Service is the most important value of Zappos, and again, he exemplifies it. So what we have the opportunity to do here today is to hear a conversation between literally two of the most interesting people in the world when it comes to leadership, advances in organizational culture, and doing things that leave the rest of the world really scratching their heads, wondering how did they do that. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Dr. Warren Bennis and Mr. Tony Shea. David. Um, uh, where's David? Thank you for that, that marvelous introduction to Tony and me. Um, this really isn't as bad as it looks, incidentally. Um, it was once said about the music of Wagner that in, um, so it was Mark Twain actually said about the music of Wagner, it ain't nearly as bad as it sounds. Well, this is uh, sort of the way... Um, I feel, but I, I, had I been wearing a pair of Zappos shoes, I never would have made the terrible fall I made four weeks ago. And uh, it's going to take me a little while to get over a bunch of broken bones and all that stuff, but um, uh, it'll get better. And, uh, and I'm just so pleased to be here with, with Tony Shea, who... Um, uh, we talked a little bit about what we might do this morning, mm -hmm. and we, we, I prepared a couple of questions before, in which he's not seen, um, I, and he's prepared a couple of questions, I think, 
which I know I've not seen. And we thought what we would do is exchange questions. I have three or four, and Tony may have a certain number. And then we're going to open it up for you to ask questions of us. Uh, if that's a way of proceeding, which I hope is agreeable uh, for you all. So can I start in, Tony? Yeah. Um, the, um, anyway, I'm very happy to be here with you guys. I was here at last year's reunion, and I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Well, my wife uh, put a kind of a railing out so I wouldn't leave the house this morning to come here, because she thought, what am I, do what am I doing with this, with this thing? So let me start in with, with a uh, couple of these questions that I um, should have here for from Tony. Um, so I put them on three by five cards. But I'll, I'll read it aloud, okay? And uh, so it, this is, I'm going to start with a, t with a two part question for you. Um, at, at dinner the other night, this last Thursday night, there was six of us were there, and uh, a woman who was the hostess. Uh, turn and ask me a question that uh, I've never been asked before. And, uh, and as David was pointing out earlier, uh, I think the questions we ask are almost more important than the answers we sometimes get. Um, questions are, I I've often wanted to teach a course on what, what is a good question, do you know? So I think the idea of just exchanging these. So this is a two-part one. Uh, the, the, the part of the other night, at the dinner party, the host just turned to me and said, at what time in your life have you been the happiest? I thought, well, that, that's really an interesting question, I thought. At what point in your life, what time in your life have you been the happiest? And then, Tony, this is the second, it was related. In your March 09 speech that I saw the transparencies for, it was entitled Delivering Happiness, which I thought was just very interesting. So what I'm going to ask you is, how do you define happiness, and why do you think it is so important? Um, <coughs> I guess... Uh, so, I guess I'll, it's it's hard to answer the the first one where it's there's a couple ways I think think about happiness. One is you know if there's a specific moments, there's definitely uh, moments that you know, just stick stick with me, and I'm I'm sure with with everyone, and uh, and so. I actually, so I actually have a book by the same name that's coming out called Delivering Happiness. It comes out in June, and we actually, I think, have advanced copies for everyone here in the audience. Uh, but basically, the book starts out with talking about. That's, really, that's the name of the book, Delivering Happiness. Yes. <laughs> and um, and uh, the book actually starts out with it describes. So for those, I don't, how many of you have heard of Zappos before? And, okay, and how, how many of you have actually shopped with Zappos before? Oh, very cool. So for those who may not have heard, Zappos was uh, acquired by Amazon last uh, November, but it was announced in July of last year, and we announced it to the company, and then two days later we held an all-hands meeting where, uh, in Las Vegas where our headquarters were, we had about seven or eight hundred employees in a room, and uh, and we basically went over, spent an hour going over everything in terms of you know we were still going to remain independent and still continue building the Zappos brand and culture the way we always have. Uh, it was going to be very different from other acquisitions that Amazon had done. And then at the end, we surprised our employees by announcing that we were, uh, Alfred and I, Alfred's the CFO and COO, were buying uh, everyone a Kindle. And then we also announced uh, as a surprise that 
So in previous all hands meetings, we had surprised them with giving everyone a one time bonus of 10% uh, of what they had, whatever they had earned in the previous year. And we surprised them that with the uh, Amazon acquisition, one of the things that we were able to do was normally they, in acquisition scenarios, the, um, they have big, uh, they call them retention bonuses or, or something that's normally restricted to the top, say, 10 or 15 people in the company. And we wanted to instead spread it around to all the employees. So we announced that we were going to give them a actual, actually 40% of whatever they had earned in, in the previous 12 months. And so um, like that moment when they heard that number, it was like it was spontaneous. Like the entire room just stood up and cheered, and people were crying. And <clears throat> there were some people that you know were wondering how they were gonna. Uh, now they could take their kid to Disneyland, uh, which they couldn't afford to do before. And there were other people where they were wondering how they were gonna go get a get a medical procedure, and now this enabled that. And so um, it it was just you know that that one moment where it, it, like it, was, it wasn't about the money, but, it, it, but it, it was everyone like standing up and cheering and crying and you know, doing that simultaneously. Like that was one of the happiest moments for mm -hmm. not just me, but for everyone. And we were all you know, experiencing that together. And so mm -hmm. that was pretty special. Um, and then uh, why is happiness uh, how do you define happiness and why do you think it's so important? Um, so one question I like to ask people is, and I would ask you guys to think about, like, what is your goal in life? And you know, if you ask different people that question, you'll get different answers. Some people will say they want to uh, uh, just grow a business. Other people say they want to find a boyfriend or girlfriend, or other people say they want to uh, run a marathon. And uh, so, I would, like, if you think about what your actual answer is, uh, and then the next question is why, and then people will have different answers, like, um, because so I can find a soulmate, or so I can be healthier, or so uh, I can make more money. And <coughs> excuse me. And and then. Uh, you ask why again, and then people will come up with different answers. But what's interesting is if you ask why, ask yourself why enough times, and ask other people why enough times, eventually everyone comes to the same answer, and it's that they believe that whatever their goal in life is will ultimately make them bring them happiness. And so, you know, we're all connected in terms of we're ultimately all just seeking happiness, and and so. You know, there's been a lot of research over the past, uh, uh, especially over the past 12 years or so. There's this whole field called positive psychology that's really just about the science of happiness. And you know, I'm not talking about kind of going to the self-help section and you know, just think positive and be happy. It's like actual research that has been done. And you know, one of the things that has come out of the research is that people are actually very bad at predicting what will make them happy bring them happiness in the long term. And you know, there's been studies of lottery winners, for example, where you look at their happiness right before winning the lottery, and then you look at their happiness a year later, and a year later it's the same or you know, even lower than it was before. And, um, and yet, you know, if I ask everyone here if you would like to win the lottery tomorrow, you probably, and do you think that would make you happier? Probably everyone would say yes. So. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And originally, I was just reading. This was a couple of years ago. I was just reading it and uh, studying it just as a hobby. And then kind of realized that actually, there's a lot of stuff that's come out of the research that's already been done that you can apply to business uh, in terms of making customers happy, uh, in terms of making employees happy. So one um, really, uh, uh, so for, for example, uh, one framework that I talk about in the book is that happiness is about uh, just four things, perceived control, perceived progress, uh, connectedness, meaning the number and depth of your relationships, and then uh, being part of something bigger than yourself that is meaningful to you. And so 
you know, some of the stuff we kind of stumbled on at Zappos and then other stuff because of the, uh, the frameworks that has come out of the research that's been done uh, can actually you know, be more purposeful about applying it to business. So for example, in terms of perceived progress, uh, we used to hire people in our merchandising department, entry level, give them all the training and so on, and then uh, they would get a promotion 18 months later, and then they would get trained and certified and so on, and then uh, get another promotion 18 months later. And so over a three year period, they'd go from entry level to becoming a full fledged buyer at Zappos, which is a, kind of a big thing within our company. Um, well, we changed it a couple years ago so that instead of a promotion every 18 months, we gave smaller promotions every six months. And they still went through the exact same process and you know, still had to get certified and so on. It still took three years to become a buyer, uh, but we found that employees were much happier because they had the sense of ongoing progress every six months instead of waiting 18 months. So it's just, I, I think it's just really interesting how you can take the stuff that's come out of the research and you know, apply it to business. Yeah. He, the, um, <clears throat> I think you also said in your book, or one of the articles about you is that happiness is also contagious. You know, that it's, uh, I, I, think, I think it is in some curious way. Um, <clears throat> it's a tough concept to get your arms around them, but I, I agree with Tony, there's a growing field it's now even being called by some of the happiness industry because it's, um, and in a way, it's a nice counterbalance to a, a society where we've been so, at least clinically speaking, psychologically speaking, so connected with the idea of pathologizing everything, you know, and to think of what is it that makes it's a, it's a very hard thing to define. Well, in the trade, it's called subjective well-being. You know, that's the usual term used for general happiness and. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting field, and I think what could be more appropriate to a service business than, than that? You know, that, that you, you are delivering happiness uh, to, to your clients, to your customers. Yeah, well, so what's interesting is that that's how we initially started. We were really focused on uh, you know, trying to deliver the best customer service and customer experience to make customers happier and then trying to really create a culture that employees, so that employees still want to be around 10 years down the road, and uh, that's about making employees happier. And then going back to uh, you know, the fourth, I talk about perceived control, perceived progress, connectedness, and being part of something bigger than yourself. Say that, as, say that more slowly. Go with it. Uh, perceived control, right. perceived progress, connectedness and uh, being part of something big, bigger than yourself. And so you know, that not only applies to individuals, but uh, it applies to companies as well. And Dave Logan's book, Tribal Leadership, we, we, had, we actually have classes at Zappos where we, uh, we teach his book and go over his book. And so you know, his framework is um, about there being five levels of companies or company culture or, or, or people. And his level five is basically about companies that, um, where it's not, so his level four is about companies where it's the entire company is unified in a team. It's like we're better than, you know, we're unified, we've, we're, we're all aligned, and we're better than the competition. But then his examples of level five behavior is, uh, it's not about killing the competition, it's about, uh, you know, his, his example is Amgen is not about when asked who your competition is, it's not naming some other drug company. It's saying our competition is cancer, for example. And so, you know, f for us, you know, part of the purpose of the book and what we try to do at Zappos, as, and this has kind of evolved over the past few years, is it's, um, it's not just about making our employees happy or making our customers happy, but kind of sharing with the world uh, what the mistakes we've made and the lessons we've learned and to help uh, make other companies mm -hmm. have stronger cultures and make their own mm -hmm. customers ha happier. <clears throat> One thing I was curious about in your background, Tony, was the first company you started, which you 
ended up selling to Microsoft, as I recall, back in 1998, yep. something like that. And I was, pr it was uh, I was surprised there because you said you, you you started off with a very small group of five to ten people, and, and then when you got to a hundred people, as I recall, you you then felt that the company culture was um, um, it lost its way. Now, what I was wondering about is why this is this is the Starbucks story too. You know, that, that came out a couple of years ago, a leaked memo that, excuse me, that he had written that we're not the Starbucks that we used to be. We're not, and he he he's I know I he. he Somebody I know f for years now. We we met each other before, uh, we, as friends, not anything anything to do with his business, and uh, but he stayed around to revive that company. You sold yours. I, I'm I'm not making a, any judgment about that decision, but I was curious as why didn't you start thinking about reviving the culture that you started with, rather than selling it? Did you think it was hopeless um, or what? Yeah. Or did you? Was yeah. Um, was it an irresistible price? Uh, it was. It was probably a combination. Um, but at, we actually hired an uh, outside CEO and at the previous company, Link Exchange. Um, well, and just to give give some background, because not every not everyone may know, but basically in 90, 1996, uh, with the college roommates, started a company called Link Exchange, and we grew that to about 100 or so people, and then two and a half years later, um, sold it to Microsoft. But what most people don't, don't know was really the primary motivation for selling the company was just because the, it just wasn't a fun place to work at anymore, and the culture just went completely downhill because we just didn't know any better to pay attention to it. it. I remember when it was just five or ten of us, it was a lot of fun. It was kind of like your typical typical dot-com back at the time. We were you know, working around the clock, had no idea, no idea what day of the week it was, uh, sleeping under our desks, uh, showering occasionally. And, um, <laughs> but you know, we, we hired all the people with the right skill sets and experiences, but not all of them are culture fits. And it's not that any one hire brought the company culture downhill, but just slowly over time, it just degraded, and um, we didn't know any better to try to actively manage it, manage the culture. And um, and so I just remember one day, like I just kept hitting the snooze button over and over again because I dreaded going into the office, and that was kind of a weird feeling because this was a company I co-founded, and if I myself didn't want to go into the office, then you know, wondered how all the other employees felt. But um, but I the other thing is, I, I also wasn't in control of the company anymore because we had hired an outside CEO. And oh, I see. So it yeah. wasn't, um, and I wasn't, you know, the sole shareholder of the company either. Yeah. So it was just easier to uh, sell the company and then start something new at that point. Do you have a question for me? Um, what... Uh, What's been the most surprising thing that you've learned over, say, the past however long you've been in the guru business? <laughs> <laughs> what was that question again? <laughs> what's, the, what's the most surprising thing you've learned? Surprising. It's funny you asked that question because... Um, well, I'm going to push Tony's book. See, again, delivering happiness. It's coming out when? June seventh. Yeah, I've read parts of it, not the whole book. It is really neat, and um, writes very well. And uh, I think an important book. And I think it's going to do well. And the, and uh, I, I charge for blurbs these days, but I'd be willing to say, give you one free. So, <laughs> so it's a it's a marvelous book. Congratulations. I think it's going to make a difference. Um, let's see. Um, and the reason 
I'm bringing your book up is to push my own. <laughs> and I've, I've um, it's my, I don't know, I don't think it's gonna be my last book, but it's gonna be my 30th book. And it's, it's a, a memoir, which is a kind of a very difficult thing to, to, to do, uh, a memoir, because it's, it's, it's very delicate because on the one hand you've got to avoid two things. One is you've got to avoid uh, kind of a grandiosity, you know, of how terrific I've been and kind of all that. You've got to also avoid the equal difficulty of false modesty. In fact, uh, one of our former presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, wrote in his, bio in his autobiography, he wrote, the bravest man I ever met in the world was the sergeant who followed me up the hill at San Juan. <laughs> well, is that subtle when you think about that? <laughs> you know? So you've got you to avoid both those things. But what, why I'm intrigued with that question of yours is I, I, the title of the book, this memoir, which is coming out uh, later in the year, uh, it's called Still Surprised. Still mm. Surprised. I did not know that. Yeah, that's what's why your question so fascinating, <laughs> and and so I'm, I mean I think I I think I'm, uh, the beauty of the beauty of being in university, the beauty of of not just being in university but of life for people, is is it, it's related to one of the things that you you write about in your core values, but humility, the the beauty of. Uh, of my life is continually being surprised about the world, about what's going on, about about uh, almost everyday occurrences. And I guess if, if I were to think about um, It's that as I review the things I've done in my life thus far, Tony, and I've been so blessed, you know, and uh, it's so funny because we come from, you and I, from two opposite, totally opposite backgrounds. You're, you were born here with Taiwanese parents, and, and, uh, and I... I don't know about your parents, but I was born in the Bronx of working class parents, and um, and, and yet, our, uh, when I read your work, I'm amazed at how much aligned it is with, uh, and I must also say surprised, about how much, though we come from such different cultures, how we've ended up pretty much in the same place, in terms of ideas, not in terms of income. I want to make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I might as well get it in now before the morning goes on too long. Um, uh, I don't get a fee for that. You know, I usually, I used to speak for fees only. And now I, and for, except, you know, the Marshalls, but usually I get something of a fee. So, I have gone on the internet a uh, couple of nights ago, and this is going to be, and I sent you two books, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. And this is you're going to be my, it's not a fee exactly, but this is what's called an exchange. For those two books, I've ordered a model shoe I want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've written it all out. It's model 993, New Balance. I've got very wide, wide feet, so it's 10 and a half. And the S K S K the number the order number is S K U, uh, number seven four six five nine six five, and it's they're not that cheap by the way, <laughs> but uh, it's my favorite shoe, and this is uh, okay. <laughs> this is so you have not actually ordered it or <laughs> what you have ordered. I wasn't clear if you had actually ordered it or you would like Oh, no, I, I haven't. I thought I would order it directly with okay. the owner. <laughs> well, uh, my, my home address, all the details are there. Okay. Ten um, and a half, four E. 
Oh, that really new, is your new home balance, address. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, I'll make sure. Uh, but, see, if I had worn no shoes the other day, I would not have been tripped on some dumb rug in, uh, nearby. Well, so. it seems like a fair trade. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'll get you something for your feet, and you get. And the next time I see hands. you, uh, the price of the books book, because I'm going to actually personally know their signs. <laughs> <laughs> No, they're going for a lot on eBay. So about, about, <laughs> so, so about, about, about surprise, I guess, uh, ju- just the, uh, 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 yeah, I'll tell you one thing that comes quickly to my mind, uh, is the um, surprise of the, the potentiality of growth. Because I know that though you don't use these specific words, I want to get back to my next question about culture. Um, uh, uh, I've been teaching this course jointly with our soon-to-be succeeded president, Steve Sample, who's been over almost 20 years a great, great university president. Amazing, you know. Um, uh, You went to a school called Harvard, which hasn't had such good success with their presidents in recent years. But never mind that. I don't want to get into that. So, but I'm amazed at the potential for growth. Surprised that these are these are. This is an honors program we teach. We have like 300 students applying. We take 40. You know, and every year I'm impressed with how much uh, the richness of of the of the life of learning. Of, uh, I mean. The beauty, the surprise of my life is I get paid for the pleasure of finding things out. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, you know, in a way, we're in the same business. I mean, I don't, I don't consider myself an entrepreneur. I admire enormously entrepreneurs, by the way. And I'm so glad that USC has been one of the leaders. And in fact, to my knowledge, it's the First year, first university that really put an emphasis on an entrepreneurial thing. So, I, I guess it's my continual surprise at the potentialities for growth, and change, and learning, and of seeing this occur almost before your eyes, like time lapse photography in the course of a semester, and it, it, which is saying a lot. I've really seen students. To, you get more of a sense of of one of, another thing that you emphasize very much is self awareness. It's how much self awareness and growth and learning come through that. So can I get to my next question to you? Okay. Um, this is uh, from a PowerPoint presentation you gave last year, and it's Zappa's core values. And you know, one of the things about about Tony's book and about his firm, and um, is is the whole emphasis on core values, and I want you to talk a little bit about how you develop those. And, well, there are ten of them in this paper, here, but the questions I have for you is really big, Tony. And I don't, and and uh, even though I've worked in in and out of this area for years, I. I think it's it's a tough one. How do you build and sustain and keep revivifying, or keep the, keep the, the the passion and the happiness continue? So it's 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 building and sustaining. How do you how do you how does a leader do that? Um, uh, the the uh, when you sold Lincoln Exchange to Microsoft, I mentioned this earlier, because the culture worsened. Those are your words. I said, why did you try to revive it? And I think of I think of uh, Howard Schultz's. I'm close to that experience because they really he really felt they lost their way. And to, how does you know, 120,000 employees? How many employees do you have? 1,600? Yeah, roughly 1,600. Yeah. How do you keep, how do you build those values at Zappos? And how do you sustain them? And, and 
because I think it's, it's a critical issue because I agree totally with you that the culture that one works in is that culture that can create happiness and love for the work, right? And, and the 10 values, you may or may not want to refer to them, but here, this is your PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, but t tell about building a culture because and a culture of growth and learning and happiness. Yeah, well, it's inter I think this was a story about Starbucks uh, that I heard back a few years ago where um, I think I, this may be, uh, I don't know if this is legend or if it's actually true, but uh, I heard someone ask Howard Schultz, how do, you, uh, how do you get all your employees to smile all the time? This was back in the early days, and his response was, I just hire people that smile. <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier than trying to train someone to smile. And so, uh, and, and it's, we have the same philosophy at Zappos. We uh, actually, you know, a lot of companies have things called, uh, they might call them core values or guiding principles or whatever, but I think the problem with most companies that have them is they're usually kind of very lofty sounding. They read like they were written by the PR department and, and, uh, and, you know, maybe you learn about it on day one of orientation, but then it just becomes this meaningless plaque on the lobby wall. And so for us, we actually do two separate sets of interviews when we hire employees. Uh, the first <laughs> set is by the hiring manager and his or her team, and it's kind of the standard, you know, looking for fit within the team, relevant experience, technical ability, and so on. But then our HR department does a separate set of interviews purely for culture fit, for core values, and... Uh, they have to pass both in order to be hired. So we've actually passed on a lot of really... You have to pass, so they have to pass both. Both sets of interviews to be hired, the one by the hiring man managing team and by the HR department. Right. And they're independent you know, yeah. sets, sets of interviews. And so we've passed on a lot of really smart, talented people that we know can make an immediate impact on our top or bottom line. But if they're not a culture fit, then we won't hire them. So you mentioned we have 10 core values. We actually have interview questions for each and every one of those core values. And, uh, and, and, and or I can give some examples. So one of, one of the... Uh, I do. I'll give a couple of So one of our core values is create fun and a little weirdness. And um, one of our in interview questions is literally on a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? And... Um, I was gonna, by the way, that's a, another question that's just coming up for you. Go on with that. Um, are you? And so uh, if you're a 1, you're probably a little bit too straight-laced for Zappos. If you're a 10, you might be a little bit too psychotic for us. And, but, um, <laughs> but it's actually not the number that matters so much as it is just seeing how candidates respond. Because some of them are trying to fish for the right answer, and they're like, well, actually, how weird, what's your answer? And then they try to come up with, with the right thing. Um, but... It's, for us, our belief is that everyone's a little weird somehow, and it's really just more a uh, fun way of saying that we really recognize and celebrate each person's individuality, and we want their true personalities to come out in the workplace environment, whether it's dealing with each other as coworkers or with customers over the phone. So you know, our uh, phone calls are not scripted. Uh, we really leave it up to each rep to interact in, in a way that fits their personality, to form a personal emotional connection with each customer one phone call at a time. And that's how we build our brand. Um, another one of our core values is to uh, be creative, adventurous, and open-minded. And so uh, one of our interview questions is, on a scale of 1 to 10, how lucky are you in life? And 1 is, I don't know why bad things always seem to happen to me. 10 is, I don't know why good things always seem to happen to me. So we try not to hire the ones because they're bad luck, and we don't want bad luck to <laughs> come to Zappos. Um, but this was actually inspired by a research study I'd read about several years ago where they actually asked that question to a bunch of random people and got answers all over the board, you know, some ones, some tens, a lot in between. And, um, and then afterwards, they had them do a task. And the task was to go through a newspaper and count the number of photos that were in that newspaper. But what the participants didn't know was that it was actually a fake newspaper. And sprinkled throughout the newspaper were these headlines that would say things like, if you're reading this headline, uh, you can stop. The answer is 37 plus collect an extra $100 when you tell the researcher this. 
And what they found was that the people that consider themselves unlucky in life generally never noticed the headlines. They just went through the task at hand and eventually came up with the right answer. Uh, and the people that consider themselves lucky in life generally saw the headlines, stopped early, and made an extra hundred dollars. So the takeaway is that it's not that people are inherently lucky or unlucky, but luck is really more about being open to the opportunity beyond just how the task or situation presents itself. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's why we asked that question for our core value number four. Yeah, I think it's an amazing question. And Napoleon, by the way, um, <clears throat> when he was thinking about appointing a, an officer into the general, a general, a high general position, would always ask them, do they feel they're lucky? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that has to do a little bit when you get over the modesty thing, when people say, yeah, I've just been lucky, but when they really talk about the attitude of feeling lucky there has a lot to do with, in a way, happiness, has a lot to do with positive outlook, do you know? Because um, I, I do think, from a lot of evidence we have, that luck does play, in circumstances does play an important role, and, um, but, but people who feel lucky tend to have a very positive outlook in the studies I've done of leadership, you know, hopeful, uh, not stupid about, you know, they're, they're, they're aware of the dangers too, but, but they, they tend to, uh, to think of themselves as... But the thing about the, the hiring process at Zappos is this. I would think, Tony, that there's no way, even in the interview, where you would be able to predict how a person would respond to those core values without having them experience the company for two or three years. Um, it would seem to me that, maybe that's too long a period of time, but it would seem to me that, um, I would think, reading about your company, that you would want to bring people in who were young and who could develop um, and, and internalize those values over time. And with some, it just wouldn't work, you know? Yeah, well, for, I mean, I guess we're less about trying to get people to adopt these values. It's more about just finding people whose personal values match the company's core values. Yeah. And then you don't have to always be thinking about, I mean, it's just much easier. Like, ev every employee just automatically is living the brand. and. Uh, you know, there's, um, I guess the way uh, I th think about it is, you know, there are companies out there that really focus on what they say, uh, and, and then there's companies out there that focus on behavior, so what they do. And then for us, we think it's just much easier uh, in the long run to just focus on who we are. And, you know, if you're hiring people who are inherently... Uh, you know, the personal values are the Zappos core values, then you don't need to focus on telling them how to behave because it just is a natural byproduct and you yeah. don't need to come up with all these policies and procedures. And, you know, which also works for some, you know, companies like, uh, you know, Disney and Ritz-Carlton, for example, they dictate certain behaviors. You have to, uh, you know, when you, when you, you have to walk a customer to the elevator, for example, or when you point, make sure to use your hand or two fingers, but not a single finger. And you know, you can come up with that as as a way of um, creating a great customer experience as well. But I think the challenge with that is it's hard to predict every possible uh, scenario that might occur. And uh, but if in, so, our philosophy is really make sure everyone understands the vision for Zappos, and for, for us it's about you know, making customers happy, delivering the very best customer service and customer experience, uh, and then if you focus on culture and hiring employees who, whose personal values match our core values, and most of the rest of the stuff just takes care of its, itself, and uh, you don't really need to you know, talk about what scripts to use on the phone or... Uh, come out with, uh, there's a lot of corporations out there trying to figure out what their social media policies should be. And you know, ours is just be real and use your best judgment. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we, we trust our employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got, let's do just two, two more. You got one for me and I got one more for you. Uh, what has been, uh, tell me about in your life the, uh, one of the most disappointing moments for you and uh, what you've learned from that experience. You ask good questions. I steal them from Dave Logan. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Logan steals them from me. Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I, I actually wanted to teach a course with somebody I, I, want, I want a partner to teach it with. I don't know why. Is what, what makes a good question? You know? I mean, th that's the, the question that facilitates the question that has resonance. Uh, uh, I think it's a, to ask that good question is, is such a, for me, so important, you know? And that's why I thought this exchange of questions would be, would be, um, would be good. But I keep forgetting the questions you asked me this then. So what was, the, uh, tell me what about was, one of the most disappointing moments yeah. in your life. I was going to say real estate, but that's too glib. Um, <laughs> so, um, first of all, I, the reason I'm it's, why it's a marvelous question is because I'm I have to think because I tend not to regret things that are disappointments, but to just say, what the hell did I learn from it? Or uh, I, the first thing that came to my mind though was um, um, the first couple of years I was president of university and I, I feel I made one big, big mistake. I mean, huge. Um, and it was becoming president of the University of Cincinnati back in the 70s. And, uh, and I... I I, it, it was a university that really, in some basic ways, needed to change. And when I say basic ways, it was going to go broke unless it became a fully state-supported university, which it now is. And I came in from the East as an outsider, you know, from Harvard, MIT, that kind of a... And I didn't take the time to really understand the city, its proudness. Um, see, the, the, dif the difficulty is that it was a city university, but only 6% of the revenue for the university was coming from the city. So it was partly a myth. And, and um, it took us three years of my work there to become, um, to finally when I got into knowing and learning more, and I realized that one of the toughest things for a change agent, as I was brought in to be, is how do you both celebrate and adhere to the symbol, celebrate and adhere to the symbols of the past, and yet invent a new culture, and to walk, navigate it without seeming disrespectful to a hundred years of previous history, where you're starting something new. And I felt I never took the time, though I was warned. I, I was warned. I was said, look, this is a very proud city, but it's very conservative. In fact, Mark Twain, whom I quoted earlier, said the most marvelous thing about Cincinnati, about its conservative ways. He once said, if the world ever comes to an end, I want to be in Cincinnati, because it will happen there 10 years later. So, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but I did not realize, Tony, you know, that, that it is disrespectful to think you're going to change your culture with, w without really taking the time to deeply understand that culture in which the foundation was laid before you can reinvent. And, and Carly Fiorina is a good example of that. It's what, it's what I call um, 
I don't mean that. Well, yeah, contextual and contextual intelligence. People talk a lot about social emotional intelligence. Very very important, but equally important is is from the old musical, The Music Man. You got to know you got to know the territory. Mm -hmm. And Carly Fiorina is a good example. A woman who, when she was appointed to CEO of HP, I, I was root, rooting for her. She was the first woman. A, B, she was the first non-engineer, and most importantly, she was the first non-HP person ever to be appointed CEO. And you know, I thought, you know, I'm rooting for her. And I kept being continually disappointed when I would meet with HP executives and they would tell me how she never got the engineering culture, she never, she, she got su seduced by the publicity, by being the poster girl, by being at the, the Davos conferences and, you know, what I call the elephant bumping con conferences where the big yeah. shots get together. And it's easy as a younger executive with overnight success to get seduced. And in her case, she never learned the culture. And, and I think my biggest disappointment, my first couple of years at Cincinnati, was people told me, uh, you know, take, be, Cincinnati is a very conservative city, don't get, just take your time to get to know the community, the faculty, your students, don't, don't get into the press, they, you know, it's, it's a very kind of Scandinavian culture, no poppy should be taller than the other, you know, and I didn't, I listened to it, I mean, I heard it, but I didn't, Mm -hmm. take it in. And I was looking back on that period, my first two, two, two years there, um, I, I really felt, boy, that's something I'm never going to, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, that, uh, that notion of contextual, contextual intelligence, and I see smart leaders failing all the time. One of the biggest reasons I think I've seen some CEOs, top leaders fail, is not understanding the territory mm -hmm. and, and that the situation. Pre uh, Senator John Kerry, a perfectly smart, able man, no, no matter what one's politics are, he is a, he's a beautiful example of this, almost as good as Car Carly. In fact, in some ways, a better ex example. This is a true story from one of his campaign managers. He was in, when he was running for president in 2004, he was in Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a, a working class town. And he was asked what his favorite sport was. He said sailing. <laughs> and then he was asked who was his favorite athlete. This is by the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette re sports reporter. Who was his favorite? Well, that year, Lance Armstrong was an American hero. Won the Tour de France, et cetera, et cetera. Who does John Kerry mention? The guy who, the German who came in second <laughs> in the Tour de France. <laughs> what is, really? <laughs> so, you, to, to get that sense, you know? Well, I guess, I, and I, I think uh, Jim Collins, uh, I think I heard this from Jim Collins, who, who wrote Good to Great, and um, in his talks, I think the short phrase to summarize what you've been saying is, rather than try to be interesting, be interested, and that, that, that phrase has always stuck with well, me. That means listening, doesn't it? Listening. Um, I, I, let, me just, let me just comment. Well, then let's open it up to the audience, yeah. okay? Um, uh, will someone keep m my attention on time? Some questions, please. Okay, yeah. I just want to make a short, a, a short a little riff on listening. I honestly believe that, that um, it's one of the most powerful um, aspects of leadership. I mean, listening, listening, not just hearing, 
In the Middle East, they have a great expression for leaders who stopped listening, I mean, hearing. They say he's got tired ears. And there's something so disrespectful about not, not being listened to, not being, uh, the, the word respect comes to my mind a lot. It's a big aspect of leadership, I think, is respect. And, a big, and an aspect of respect is, is really, really, really hearing and listening others. In your case, the customer, but also your employer, you know. Okay, let's open it up. David, shall we? You know, it's interesting you're talking about uh, happiness and the idea of the happiness as moments versus sort of that sustained, serene, sublime sense of satisfaction and happiness. And we live in a very complicated world where there's no lack of bad news and grim prognostications. Um, I was seeing a quote the other day from Ronald Reagan. He said, uh, optimistic thinking is a choice and, frankly, a good choice. Um, and then there was a gentleman, I don't know if it was Martin Seligman, that wrote the book Learned Optimism, if you've ever read that book. What's, and what's, what's the book called? Learned Optimism. And oh, yeah, he did Seligman. Did Seligman, yeah. right. I think it was Martin Seligman. He did this great study on the Met Life salesman and who was more successful. And it turned out they profiled, they were the optimist and the pessimist. And the optimist sold 27% more than the pessimist did. Um, they also live longer, by the and way. And live longer. But yeah. the other thing that what, what he reluctantly acknowledged toward the end of the book was, it says that, and I'm sort of quoting this out of context, it says, uh, optimists tend to be slightly out of touch with what's going on, but they're happier. And pessimists tend to see better what's going, they're slightly sadder, but they're in better context with what's really going on around them. Uh -huh. um, and so I, I guess my question to you is, <laughs> that if we are listening and watching, you can't help but see all the negative potentials, whether it's in your business, the world around you, the economy, certainly the healthcare debate has uh, accelerated that in the most gruesome way. Um, how do you achieve happiness while still staying in real touch with what's going on around you? Um, well, I guess, I, I would have two answers to that. Um, I, I remember when I was in uh, Kentucky where, where our warehouse is and uh, was watching uh, in, the, in the hotel lobby, there was this comedian on TV and he said, when you're, when, when, and I guess he had just gotten married and he said basically you have a choice when you're married. You can either be happy or you can be right. And, <laughs> and so, uh, and he's, you know, with his relationship, was choosing to be to be happy. Um, but I think a lot of it, it's not so much about, I guess, being out of touch as it is about just deciding what to focus on. And uh, you know, you. So so it's so I guess I'm not. I don't know that, um, well, we were talking about earlier in terms of the optimism that entrepreneurs have, but, uh, mm -hmm. but the entrepreneurs that are able to create businesses are still in touch with all the realities, but they are optimistic about what can be accomplished. And so, uh, but then, and, and I guess I would separate that from people that are just, you know, not in touch at all with reality and, you know, are, and are always optimistic even if there's no, even if the reality of the situation says they shouldn't be. So I think it's a, it's, it's a subtle difference, but um, maybe rather than use the word optimism, which, you know, different people have different interpretations of, I would use, uh, maybe invent a new phrase like, on like optimism or, or something like that. I think it's a marvelous question, just a quick response. Uh, I think uh, it, it, it is true you can see both sides of it, as just to, Tony was saying, but it would be nice to have a couple of people around you if you're a person like me. Um, 
I think it's no accident that my wife I call Dr. No, you know, because never, I mean, because I tend to be impulsive about certain things, and she's always there. And she's also, if, you, you know, in the, my memoir I have a line that says, any man over 60 should marry a doctor. I did. And uh, so she's always ready to say, why are you doing this? And why, I mean, sometimes it gets to be a pain in the, in the neck, but I always find it useful. So putting it into an executive suite, to have a pe some people around you who are, tend to look at the dark side more than you do, is quite helpful. Hi, this uh, question is for Tony. Uh, by the way, Tony, my name is James Shea, and I have to thank you for bringing the Shea's name to a worldwide brand household name. Okay. By, by the way, just a comment. So last name is uh, spelled H-S-I-E-H. -E yes. And, um, you, oh, you're not Irish. I thought you were. <laughs> um, and so I'm sure you've come ac across the same uh, issue, but... Anytime I try to spell it out to people, people always, almost, I'd say 80% of the time, if I just say H-S-I-H, they write S-H. And so... Brother, I feel your pain. Okay. Yes. But, so I'm going to... And whoever invented our last name spelling, I, I must contest. But I'm going to give you some tips, actually, uh, that I've learned over the years. So what I found is, for whatever reason, if you just say H-S-I-E-H, people all, almost always write down S-H. But if you say H as in Harry, S as in Sam, I-E-H, they always get it right. That's exactly how I do it, too. Uh, really? <laughs> and you Great. use Harry and Sam? That's weird. Yeah. Um, anyways. <laughs> so, um, and then, but, so I always thought, like, you know, the last name was one of those things that just didn't make sense, because it's pronounced Shea, but it's I before E. It's just really confusing. But <laughs> I did discover, if you actually translate it into Morse code, it's four dots, three dots, two dots, one dot, four dots. So there's a wow, little... Wow, I learned something today. <laughs> So, uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, making us famous. Uh, but at the same token, <laughs> thank you for putting a lot of pressure on me. You know, uh, one, day, one day my father opened up the newspaper and, and showed me the newspaper and saying, Hey, son, this kid, Tony Shea, is only 33. You're almost 40. And uh, how come your income's much less than his? <laughs> <laughs> and we're both in the Internet field. I, I own an Internet marketing consulting company. And so I have this question for you. Um, uh, because did you ask permission to ask a second oh, question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> May I ask you the, the most important question, I guess, um, is that I know you emphasize a lot on um, culture, uh, your company culture. And I can't help uh, stop thinking this is what made Zappos very profitable today. Uh, did you have the foresight that uh, shaping this culture was going to make your company profitable, or was it just it just happened naturally for you? Uh, no, I, I, uh, ori originally it was just for selfish reasons. Uh, I just didn't want to, I, I was more just thinking about what would I personally enjoy. Uh, and you know, for the first four or five years, culture, was, it was more about let's not make, you know, I didn't want to make the same mistake I made at Link Exchange. So we always said, okay, culture is important. But it wasn't actually until five years or so into it that we decided to actually make culture the number one priority for the company. And, it, and so it was only uh, at that time that we explicitly you know, went through this year-long process of asking our employees what should our core values be and, uh, and then put into place all the processes and procedures, for, you know, like the two sets of uh, uh, hiring interviews that, that we do. Um, and then you know, part of me, and it was probably right about that time where I read um, Good to Great by Jim Collins, and you know, they, they looked at, and, and, and so I don't think we're really pioneering anything new. Like, we're just, re, like, re, I guess, learning on our own what's already been researched out there. And you know, in Good to Great, Jim Collins talks about, you know, they look at what separates the great companies from just the good ones in terms of long-term financial performance. And... Uh, two of the things that they found the great companies had that the good ones didn't. Were, one was uh, really a really strong culture or core values. And um, one of the things they found was that it actually doesn't matter what your core values are. It just matters that you have them and you commit to them. 
because that creates alignment in the entire organization. Everyone speaks a common language, and it's just a default way of thinking. And, um, and then the second thing was having a vision or a uh, higher purpose beyond just money or profits or being number one in the market. And so those were things that you know, we had kind of accidentally stumbled into and you know, slowly over time adopted for ourselves. And it just, I, I think we just got lucky in that you know, it actually turns out to be the stuff that uh, Jim Collins says we should do. And, and same with uh, tribal, tribal leadership. They found similar things. Uh, David, is there a chance, would, would you mind if, if, if the, your 10 values, Zeppel's core values, were distributed to the alumni? Uh, yeah, it's actually, they're actually in the book, too. So oh, it's in, the book. Okay. the book. It's in the yeah. book. Okay, good, because they're very, I think they're, they're I think they're so all 10. And if there were time to get into how, you, how we created this in the organization is really interesting, too. Time for more? So in just a few moments we have left, let's turn to what we call burning questions, which means if you don't ask the question that you have in mind, there's a chance you may spontaneously combust later in the day. <laughs> so we have a burning question back here. Uh, thanks for coming out here. You had mentioned in um, that the culture, when you first started, kind of got away from you. And we've read countless case studies of cultures that have started strong and then sort of meandered off to the side which would make the assumption that a culture can change even without the consent of the very top. So for those of us who are in the middle of an organization, um, how can we impact and sort of course correct the culture um, to make it for, for the better? Because obviously it happens, but what, can, what active steps can we do to sort of change the direction the way we might think things should be? Uh, so for, for us at, at, at Zappos, uh, you know, the, most organizations, as they grow larger, the culture goes downhill, and uh, it can't be up to just the top, however many uh, you know executives or, or whatever. It, the only way, you know, not only do we not want the culture to go downhill, but we actually want it to get stronger and stronger as more employees come. Like we want the culture to scale, and so the only way that can happen is if every employee views as part of his or her job responsibility to uh, help to live and inspire the culture and others and help build those cultures. And so we're always trying to think of, OK, what's, uh, what's next and what's next? And actually, one of the um, pretty exciting projects that we're working on internally is actually a result of uh, Dave Logan's um, work. At, with, and, and he talks about um, how, ma how many of you have read Tribal Leadership? And so in a, he talks about uh, creating triads and basically three-person relationships instead of two two-person relationships. And you know, there's a few uh, interesting things about that. If, if you actually graph out, you know, the relationships in an organization, and uh, he actually just visited Zappos a few weeks ago and showed us a sample company they had worked with, it actually doesn't take that many. Uh, if you're strategic about it, it, it actually doesn't take that many triadic relationships to actually shift a culture to from level three to level four, or um, or just get everyone more more connected. And so, one of the things that we're in the process of building at Zappos is actually uh, using our own internal tools. We we have this thing called the face game, where like any, before you can, as part of the process of logging into our systems. Uh, it actually just shows you a random employee's face, and then it used to be you have it's multiple choice. You have to guess who it is, and then and then once you guess it, then it shows you that employee's bio, and you know kind of like the equivalent of a Facebook profile page, but it's on our internal system. So we actually just launched and uh, modified the system so that if they guess correctly, it'll ask them how well do you know this person on a scale one to five, and five being we're going to be lifelong friends, and you know one is uh, one or to is like, I'll say hi to them if I happen to pass in the hallway. And, uh, and so from that, we're, our system is uh, basically we want to create our own internal social graph that uh, looks at not only how many triads we have, but the strengths, the different types of triads and, and the strengths of triads. And then, um, and then we want employees to be uh, more conscious about just the concept of, of triads. And, one of the interesting things I uh, 
learn from, uh, from, from the book and, and from uh, Dave Logan about triads is that it's the response. If there's three people, so let's say yourself, myself, and, uh, and then one, one other person, each, the third person is the one that's responsible for the strength of the other two people's relationship. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so if you and I get into um, an argument about shoes or something, then uh, this person acts as kind of mediator, trans mod moderator. And, uh, and the, but if each person in the triad actually feels and knows it's their responsibility to strengthen the other two's relationship, it creates a pretty interesting uh, you know, dynamic. And, and so, so, I don't, so that's where we're headed. And, and I think that's something where you don't need to be at the top <coughs> of an organization to start forming more triads in, in your company. We have time for just one more burning, burning, burning question. <laughs> okay, saw your hand first. <laughs> it's kind of uh, along the line was he, uh, what he was saying about for culture. Now that you sold the company to Amazon, how do you think the two will match together? Because obviously they're very different. And are there steps or agreement of between you and between Apple and Amazon to mesh well together? Or? Uh, yeah. Well, so specifically, uh, you know, aside from, I mean, the the only one of the uh, prerequisites for us to even consider the whole Amazon acquisition was that they leave us independent. And so from our perspective, it's basically been the equivalent of swapping out our board of directors with a new one. And, and actually, they've, our previous board were re really more, uh, came more from a technology background, uh, didn't really have much retail experience. And so uh, if, if anything, you know, having a new board, quote unquote, you know, it's not officially a board. We call it a management committee. But it's basically three people from Zappos and three people from Amazon. So the, the equivalent of a board of directors, we meet quarterly. Uh, but having a board that gets retail much more and, you know, they have the whole history and really value, thinks in the long term in terms of customer experience and what's right for the customer, um, that's been great. But then at this, but they've also uh, allowed us to do our thing, the, you know, things the Zappos way, continue to build our culture, our brand, run business our way. And so we've actually come across instances where uh, something is not right for Amazon to do. Uh, like they make a decision about something. Just, they say, no, we're not going to do this, or we're taking this stance on this, and we've taken the opposite stance in terms of, uh, for example, what vendors to work with or, uh, or even what... Uh, who to partner with, for example. And so we've actually had a few instances where we t tested our independence and they've remained true to their word. So. Okay. Well, so first of all, let's give them both a round of applause. <laughs> And what would a visit to USC or Marshall be without a certificate of appreciation? So, Tony, if you stand, I think this is a photo op. So, okay. Tony, on behalf of everyone at USC and Marshall, thank, thank you. you very much. I feel like I just graduated. <laughs> and, and to our own Warren Bennis, thank you. <laughs> Let me come around here. Warren, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And the, the last thing we need is another plaque from USC, but here's another plaque from USC. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Again, a round of applause.